so we don't when we don't clap them for Alan. It's not going to be good. All right, let's pray. God, obviously, you are God. You planned um, everything that is going to happen this morning. It happened the way that it has. Lord, you are with Pastor Bob. You are with him now. Um, you are with us here. You have a message for us. Wait until you find out what it is. Um, Lord, I, I just thank you for that. I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for the work that you've done in my life. And Lord, the lives that have been here. I pray, Father, for ears that are not open, that you would open them for hearts that haven't received, that they would receive. Please work right now in a mighty, mighty way. Amen. All right. Well, my great idea that I thought was a great idea, I guess God already said it wasn't a good idea, um, was that I was going to have a video played of Jesus in the Park. It's a promo video that we had of an event back in 2000, 2001, and 2002, and music was going to come on there, and you're going to see all these people at Roner Park, and music playing loudly and everything, and I was going to feel bad for uh, some of you that don't like loud music. I was sitting in here, but I was going to try to get a point across, and the point was supposed to be about God. So when um, I got the wonderful phone call from Ted um, a little while ago, and he said, uh, said so we've got to figure out what we're doing for the sermon this morning, I, I went through a few different ideas, and so what I landed on um, was a testimonial-type sermon. Meaning, I'm going to talk a little bit about what God did in my life and some other people's lives in this area and hope that what comes out of it is not God or not Alan is great or not other people are great or wow, that was a neat thing or that was something that happened in the past or whatever and it's not happening anymore, but God is good. God is working, and that it is important for us to abide in God and preach His Word. That was what I was hoping. I was hoping that anyone that is in here who may never have really felt like God touched my life, or God did touch my life, but then didn't remain just totally moving in my life, or I don't feel Him as much right now, or whatever the case is going on, or things around the world are just so chaotic and so crazy that I just don't know if God is moving, or I don't know how God is going to do anything. I want you to know that, I mean, we all know that individually, those of us who know Christ, there's a reason why we, why we know Christ. Something happened to us. We heard the message of truth, we received the message of truth, and it has done something in us. And sometimes we go through different times where we're wondering, like, well, is what I believe really true? Did God really do that? Am I crazy? Am I wrong? What if? What if? All these different kinds of things, they go through our minds, and we wonder, like, I'm not sure. And then we get different mountain highs and valley lows, and all these different things happen. And so my hope is that we would open up the truth of God again this morning, be able to relate to each other, because I know this isn't just an experience that happened to me, it happened in all of us that know God, that we're going to see it, that we're going to be reminded of it, and that we're going to be excited, and that we're going to abide in Christ, and we're going to trust Him, and we're going to go out this morning again, another Sunday, ready to be warriors and soldiers for Christ. So I grew up in a... Christian home. These are my parents over here. I'm taller than both of them. Although now I'm starting to get a little bit shorter also, and now my son over there keeps reminding me I'm short. But it's usually when he's wearing his boots, and I'm not. Sorry, and I have a microphone. Um, so 
Uh, at seven years old, uh, I came home from church one Sunday, asked my dad, what was that all about? I was talking about communion. My dad and I were together alone in the room. He told me what Jesus did for me. He said, you know, we're, we're all imperfect. We sin. And so there's a penalty. And Jesus paid that penalty. And he died on the cross for your sin. And that's what the, the juice is about, the, the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. The wafer is the bread, his body was broken for you, and so we take it as a symbol of forgiveness for our sins. And so he said, would you, would you like to receive Jesus? And I remember this like, like it was yesterday. I'm sitting there in the, in the living room, and I said yes, and so I prayed the uh, sinner's prayer after my father, and as soon as I said the prayer, I remember a feeling, like it was specific, like a light bulb going on inside of me. And my dad asked me, do you feel different? And I said, no. <laughs> the first thing I did was sin <laughs> right after I became a Christian. And so I grew up in a family that was always involved in church, always going to youth group. Um, when, when my dad retired from the army, we moved here, back here. Uh, my mom's side of the family is here. And I was going to Hydesville Church a lot, super involved in the youth group, all the way through high school and everything. But it was, it was about after I graduated from Fortuna High, Jacob Hayes, who goes to church here, he and I living in, our, in a house together and stuff where I just knew my focus really in my heart was not on God. I did not have an intimate relationship with Jesus like I should. I was being convicted of it. And so God was doing something where it was like, Alan, get rid of this. Get rid of that. Start focusing on me. And so God, how he does things, and you could attest, uh, testify to this too, usually is working things out in many different ways. And I mean this by uh, uh, BJ and Justin Stockman and stuff. I met those guys. They were part of uh, like the church kids that had the, the, uh, the, went to the Christian school over there, and I had my heathen friends from, <laughs> from over at... Fortuna High, yeah, not all of them, or some of the Christians, whatever. We, we all started hanging out a lot together, and, and I was just like, the conviction inside was so strong from the Lord, saying, Alan, focus on me, that we started doing Bible studies together. I was involved in, in different youth groups in Lolita, youth groups in, over there in Hydesville, and uh, even with some of our own friends, and I was so afraid. The conviction was so strong inside of me during this time period of fear, of turning away from the Lord and wallowing in a direction that I wasn't supposed to, that I was so determined to make every night of the week of that time in my life something, some sort of function that I was committed to, that I had God just coming through like a fire hydrant into my mouth, just more and more and more. And I didn't know a lot of how to study the Bible properly or any of these things. You know, I had the general idea from going to church and stuff growing up. But some of the passages that I think really caught my heart were out of Luke. And I want to do two different passages out of Luke here. If you want to follow along, I'm in Luke chapter 9. And we'll do verse, starting with verse 57. I'm going to the end of the chapter. It's the cost of following Jesus. So Luke 9, 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus told him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, 
No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I want to look ahead now to Luke 14, the cost of discipleship, beginning with verse 25. Now the great crowds accompanied him, Jesus, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That is very clear. It is super black and white. In fact, it is scary. And some of it sounds kind of crazy. Hate your father and mother, children, leave your children, let the dead bury their own, unless you take up your own cross. But we know, most of us, what we're talking about is putting God first. We have to count the cost of discipleship. We have to evaluate for ourselves, do we really believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you? It's scary. I mean, look at the church that's in Ukraine right now. You know, I was reading... um, uh, article from the Samaritan's Purse about Franklin Graham being over there during Easter and with the choir over there and some of the pastors who were there and stayed there even though Russians are coming in and they're fighting and they know that they could die within days. Why are they staying there? Because they believe Christ so much that and know that there's others there that don't know Christ that could die they don't hear the message, and they want to be there for them, and they're willing to give their life for them. The cost is so high, but if it's true, if Jesus really is God, if he really died on the cross for our sins, it is worth it. There is nothing that matters more. Not the American dream, not democracy, not retirement. Nothing matters more if this is true. We can go on after church. We can go to any barbecues that we have for 4th of July. The train of our life can keep going and going, going and going from day to day. And if we don't stop and ask ourselves the question and deal with this, We could die and go to hell. And it says that hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. We can't imagine. And it's forever. You know, there's this, uh, I'm going on a rabbit trail. I really need to get back on this. Um, There's this song that has been stuck in my head lately because I've been running and then I got my my song playlist. So there's this Bon Jovi song. Yeah, I know. 
Bon Jovi song that I've just been loving while I'm running and going along with it is called It's My Life. And it's just rocking and, and it says, it's my life. It's now or never. I ain't going to live forever. I just want to live while I'm alive. My heart is like an open highway. Frankie, Frank Sinatra, Frankie said I did it my way. I know, it's real cool. I just want to live while I'm alive. That's the American dream. Enjoy, go out, live, work so that you could have all of this or whatever the case may be. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It says, worship God. The problem is, is that we have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the truth, so it is true. We have fun. We could do all these different things, right? It is our life in a sense. Each of us have a life. And it is true that if you don't know Christ, you aren't going to live forever, but in a, in a way you are, right? You're going to go to hell forever. But we know what he means by the song. So the, so the truth is, it's Jesus' life, and it is now or never or forever in heaven or hell. So these words, the cost of discipleship, God's conviction from his Holy Spirit working in me, laid on me like a ton of bricks. And so we're moving and moving, and, and God is bringing in people into my life, like Isaiah Honor and BJ and Justin and all these different people in my life, and God is moving. And, and Pastor Mike and Pastor Jeff over there, Pastor Bob, people here at this church, we had prayer meetings and everything, and here's what happened. Okay, I'm going all over the place. All these things are going on in my life. And about six months into this, there was a period of time where Jake moved out of the house. So I had this house all, by to, my, all, all to myself. And there was times where I was just waking up in the middle of the night and I felt the presence of God. And I would sit there quietly and just not want, want to stop. I just don't want it to go away. You, you might know. And just sitting there just basking in it. I don't know how to describe it. And I remember a time, and this, is, this was kind of like, I think, at that, at that moment, for the stepping stones, a breaking point in my life where I was just, there was a prayer. God, use me. If you never want me to get married, I don't get married. If you want me to be a garbage man for the rest, nothing against garbage men, I mean that. If you want me to be a garbage man for the rest of my life, I'll do it. If you want me to go to Africa and I hate the heat, I'll do it. And I meant it. I knew it was true. And I was ready. I said, but God, would you use me for something big? About three weeks later, 4 a.m. in the morning, I woke up, and I, I feel weird when I describe this stuff because I'm not like a... I don't know what's going on here. I saw... What I don't dis I can describe anything else other than a vision. No, I didn't see a picture on the wall. I didn't see that. I didn't ha hear a voice, but there was a clarity of an an event, an outreach of people in our community coming specifically over there in a Roner Park in thousands. The next morning, four a.m. Same thing. More. Next morning, four a.m. Same thing. More. And it wouldn't leave. I was like 18. And so I'm on my way to CR. Wouldn't leave. I don't know what to do. Pull over my car. God, I don't know what's going on here, but if you're trying to, I think you're trying to tell me something. If you are, 
Please open the door. Please make it worse. So I, after, after school that day, I went over to Pastor Jeff. He used to be the associate pastor up here at Hydesville Church. And I said, Jeff, I have this idea. Brrr, this is it. He's a crazy 18-year-old, right? That's great, Alan. I said, Jeff, I think you should do this. And Jeff says, Alan, I think it's a great idea. You should do it. Okay. So what happened? And, and basically, it was so, so much in me, I just started telling all these people to, at the Bible studies that God had already started orchestrating. All these com- all this groups of people were already starting to meet through this time period. You see, God's doing this stuff. Who's going to listen to me, an 18-year-old? And I just started saying. And then people like BJ were the ones teaching the Bible that, that knew it better. And in amongst all that, in the prayers and all that, people were excited. They were like, yeah, let's go, let's do this thing. And you, some of you were part of it. We would go around to all these different churches and have prayer meetings. We came here, and there would be 60 people. We didn't have a time frame on it. We were all college students. We didn't have families. <laughs> well, we did, but they weren't our immediate family. And we were around and just praying just forever. There was assembly, people from the assembly church, people from the Pentecostal church. Too. There were some Catholics that were coming. There was this and that. Yes, I don't agree with all these different theologies, but the point is God was doing something. These were bridges and walls and stuff that there were in different groups. And people were coming together and just praying. We had meetings that were over at Hydesville Church. And I remember this one time as uh, Pastor Mike or Jeff said, uh, it's amazing, like, the people that are starting. I mean, there were officials, city officials that had nothing to do. I mean, didn't usually go to church or anything. They're coming for the planning of this event. So, okay. So all this stuff's going on. Well, I'll say one more thing. Two, wait, two more things. Okay, so in this one's relevant to 4th of July. 4th of July, one weekend, I was in Eureka, and it was like the second year or something like that, and I saw these people wearing Jesus in the Park shirts, if you ever go to some of those things. For this, oh, I didn't even tell you what their name was. It's called Jesus in the Park. Okay. So we're over there, kids walking along with a shirt, and I'm like, wow, Jesus in the Park, what's that? And he's like, man, it's like the coolest event. You need to come to it. And I'm like, all right, I'll think about it. And then there was another time we were swimming down at Miranda Bridge, and there was a youth group. I didn't even know who they were. There was some youth group down in Southern Humboldt, and these kids had all these flyers. I've never seen these flyers before in my life. And they're passing them out to go to Jesus in the Park. And I'm like, what's this? And they're like going on and on and on about it. And almost everything they said was accurate except for some of the people that were supposed to be coming to do at, at the event. I never even heard of these people before, but supposedly they were coming to the event that we were organizing. So a few months later... I think it was about three months later, the first year, after all this was going on and people were saying, let's, let's do it, we had an event. We, it became a 501c3, a nonprofit organization. There was a bunch of people that were involved in volunteering in it. Uh, I think we had raised some like 10000 some odd dollars. And then there was people, and it was a free event, free food for the public, um, some bands that came. We estimated around 1,500 people or so, an evangelistic outreach, uh, uh, the gospel message provided. And, and people came to hear Christ. And some of them came to know Christ. And we tried to follow up with them and so on and so forth. And it grew over the three years, uh, three years of having this. It's a one-day event. But it wasn't just a one-day event because throughout the year we were meeting and praying. There was people, there was ministry going on around it. And so there was a unifying vision and desire to see people come to know Christ in our area. And God was doing all these things, and he brought some bigger names to some of this thing, relatively, um, that were, I was hoping to show the video and stuff, but, um, and we estimated, I don't know, 4,000 or so people, maybe more, or whatever, the final year, I think we said 5,000, I don't know if it was really 5,000, but there was a lot of different people that came, a lot of different things that happened and stuff, and so that was a mountain high experience, event, things going on, things, people excited for Christ. And God was working and doing different things in my life. But since then, I haven't always been on this mountain. You know, oddly enough, um, before the third event, I guess during the second event, I started going to Bible school. 
in, uh, in Reading. And in Reading, I, uh, I lived in the dorms, and so I had a roommate. And um, what started to slip away at Bible school was my devotional time. There was always someone around me. And it's not their fault. It's my fault because I, didn't, I wasn't disciplined enough to go away, spend time. And what happens when I'm not abiding? Start going into the routine. My knowledge of Scripture increased. My relationship with intimacy with God decreased. And so that has been a, a, a constant struggle in my personal life has been sometimes going back and remembering how sweet it was to go out to the beach for eight hours, have the Bible, read it for a while, and just sit with God. And it was amazing when that relationship was there, when it says, ask anything in my name, because you're praying in the will of God, because you know the will of God, and he's given you direction, what happens? But that's diminished so many times, and I get different highs and lows and growing in knowledge of different things here and there, but that's not been easy. Another another thing that, that has been sad to see is so many people that have been involved in this have had divorces. So many strong Christians. So many ones that, that, that were like solid, that were vibrant for the truth. Some of them are divorced and they're back in church. And it doesn't mean you lost your salvation if you get a divorce. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying so much has happened. So many times we're in spiritual high or so many different things. And then we fall away. We don't focus. We don't obey the word of God. And things fall apart. So, looking back, you know, we always look back at our own lives and we try to evaluate things. And you know, was it was it just an emotional high? Was it a fluke? You know, many people say, "I want you to do that again." Or the question is, "Would I have done it again?" In in, in the honest, hundred percent answer, obviously, with those of you that have been around and know this or know me well enough, it wasn't me. These things happen over and over and over again in this word of God we see in our own lives when we abide in him and we seek him. He moves us. And sometimes it's the most unlikely person, the Gideon, a boy, or Goliath, right? Or Paul, that was Saul, persecuting the church. And God does it. Opens up his eyes. Scales fall from his eyes. Goes around telling people about Jesus. People are like, God, you want me to go to him? Isn't he the one that's killing us? That's why whenever I'm up here, and, and I know I've said it before, and some of my analogies are pretty cheesy, and I say, like, some of the most powerful, I always say, you know, special forces guys, those are the cool ones that can do X, Y, and Z. And then I say, well, special forces, like, Christian that knows God real well. That would be the ultimate one. But realistically, the one that's the most powerful that you're looking at out here, a lot of times I thought Arlene Stryver and her prayer. Her prayer. The ones that know Christ and are moving. And so when I look at her, when I'm praying, when, we're, when I'm speaking right now, I don't care where we're at in our life. I don't care if it's Jeremiah, it's the youngest one sitting in here right now. God does it. He uses us and he moves through us to do things. So abiding in Christ is the key. So 
If you would, would you turn to 1 John, and we're going to go to uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Do you confess that Jesus is God? Do you? It's everything. Would, would you turn to Second Timothy? All right, where did I want to go? I see this up here somewhere. All right, Second Timothy chapter four. So if we do believe these things, if God has moved in you. And this is the Word of God. And God saves people through the Word of God. Then we need to obey to spread the message of Jesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Have you guys noticed any of that lately? We see it all the time. You can choose if you want to be a boy or a girl. If it's okay to murder a child in a womb or not. You can choose if you want to be a dog or a cat. I think now. That's what the world is telling us. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. If you're blind, if you don't believe that Jesus is the truth, then you are God. You're going to serve yourself. You're going to do what you want to do. And so you're going to fill yourself with teaching that pleases what you want. That's what we see. But they were born with homosexuality desires. Homosexual desires. I believe they probably are tempted with homosexual desires. I also believe that there's a lot of people that are born with anger problems. And then they murder. I believe there's people that also are born with desire to lust. There's people that are born with desires to steal. They're sin. They're not of God. They don't honor God. So God doesn't say, I hate you if you struggle with this or that. He says, turn. He says, come to me. Hear my word. It says right here, it says, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. So we're supposed to do that to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Turn them. Speak the truth. 
trust in the Lord, abide in Him, so that these blind eyes can be opened. So that people can receive Christ. We can speak and we can argue till we're blue in the face. We can watch CNN and then watch Fox. We could do this. We would say, well, I'm going to side with these guys, with these guys. Yeah, okay, so this guy made a comment that makes more sense to us than this guy. But it's not going to do anything to save anyone's soul if all we do is keep this mud flinging one way or to the other. But we don't water down the gospel. We don't say, we're going to change the message. What we do is we speak the truth in love. He opens up a murderer's heart to turn. That's what he did to Saul. And he became Paul. And Saul, Paul, still sinned afterwards. He still had dissensions. Remember when he had the problem with Barnabas? And then they split? I don't know who was right or what, whatever happened there. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he taken our sin from us. If they don't know what a sheep is, you teach them what a sheep is. You don't change the word. You preach the word. And be ready in season and out of season. If they're struggling with homosexuality, don't don't be afraid to say it's a sin. Why? Because you love them. And you want them to know the truth. And it's not your words that will turn their heart. It is the truth. Preach the truth in love. Abide in Christ. Seek Him and He will do the saving. And they'll turn For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the myth. As for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Does it seem like your own life has some of these obstacles? I'm reminded of, I just shared them. Does it look like that's happening around you a lot? Endure suffering. Trust in the Lord. Do the work of an evangelist. Keep speaking the truth. Preach the gospel to ourselves daily. Trust in God, abide in Him, and fulfill our ministry. I'd like to finish with First John in the book of First John. We'll look at um, chapter one, verses five through ten. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves, and the truth of God, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. One of the scariest things for me, reading the book of 1 John over and over again, is how black and white the book is. Light and dark. It says, if you're living in sin, you're not a child of God. And then, 
it says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the truth is not in us. So here's the great hope. Here is the wonderful word that we can go away with today. Is that, yes, if you know Christ, he is in you. You've been sealed. Continue to walk in him. Abide in him. And he will abide in you. And if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from unrighteousness. You're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. We struggle with sin. Okay? It's not saying that you're going to be sinless if you're a Christian. But it is saying, look, if you know this is the Word of God, something specific, something in your devotional life, something that God is showing you, if you know God is saying this, and you're behaving like this, and it's not in line with the Word of God, you better be afraid. You better sin. You better abide and listen to Him. And the good news is, is He loves you. He is faithful and just. Confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. So I guess the conclusion with all that was I've said this morning was thinking of just my own personal life and the testimony, trying to bring in in the idea of the testimony in my life to the community here because there's there's been inner workings with each other and stuff like that. Let's let's have confidence in Christ. Let's trust that He will do what seems most unlikely if we trust in Him. Let's pray. Let's pray for Biden's heart. Let's pray for um, Putin's heart. Let's pray for our believers that are hurting. Let's pray that Pastor Bob, if it's God's will, will keep preaching the word here for another 50 years. I don't know. Let's seek God boldly, knowing that he will do things beyond our dreams. You'll never know what God might do, but it'll always be in accordance with the truth in His Word. Let's take communion now. If uh, you would like to join in us uh, for communion, go ahead and come forward and, and, and take the element, and we'll sing and conclude.
What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Evaluate our hearts right now as we go to communion, confessing um, anything that, that might be keeping us um, from who you might be. Um, we'll pray aloud. If there's someone that maybe you're having an issue with. Realizing where they're really the issue is, and uh, that we're not necessarily better in and of ourselves. God would be working in our hearts, in our hearts. We just thank the Lord for His sacrifice, for dying on the cross for our sins, for shedding His blood for us where we don't deserve it. Out of First Corinthians, um, chapter eleven, um, the passage with the Lord's Supper, where Jesus is with his disciples at the table, and um, they break the bread, drink the wine to symbolize uh, his blood and his body. It says in verse twenty-three, "For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he prayed." took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus' body. same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood, so the promise. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We get a picture of abiding in forgiveness as often. Totally coming back to Christ. Abiding, abiding in Christ. Our Heavenly Father, I have no idea um, if my words were clear, but I hope your words Pray, Father, that we would abide in this time from you. May you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, cause us to proclaim your name, so that others might hear and know that we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen.
salvation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you for refuge, to Jesus fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. In every condition, in sickness and health, in poverty's veil, or abounding in wealth, at home and abroad, on the land, on the sea, as thy days may demand, so thy strength ever be. When through the deep waters he calls thee to go, the rivers of grief shall not overflow, for he will be with thee thy trouble to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That soul, though all hell should. 